is the GI tract, digestion, absorption, secretion, excretion, okay? This is all just a basic review again of your anatomy and physiology. Let's talk about the components of the GI tract. All right, so we start at the beginning or start at the top, we have what? Mouth, what happens in the mouth? Okay, you have saliva, chewing, exactly. So you have the mechanical breakdown of food. You have saliva, which does what? Exactly. It's got some enzymes in there that starts to break down from those complex carbohydrates. Then you go next to the esophagus. What's at the bottom of the esophagus? That's going to come up today. Very good. The pyloric sphincter, also known as the cardiac sphincter, which is at the top of the stomach. Okay, sphincter is a muscle, circular muscle, that actually helps to keep the food in the stomach. All right, um, when there is a problem with that, it's not as strong, then you can have issues with regurgitation. The vagus nerve, cranial nerve number 10, innervates that sphincter, okay? So that's important to understand because when you have infants who are preterm, usually this cardiac sphincter is more immature. Um, stomach, all right, so we're talking about the stomach's next area. How long does food stay in the stomach, approximately? That's right. That's right. It's about an hour only. They, you know, you have about, they say it starts to really digest and break down after that time. And then it goes into the first part of the small intestine, which is the duodenum. Okay, it goes through the pyloric sphincter, which is actually at the bottom of the stomach. Okay, the pyloric sphincter is before the, uh, the contents leave the stomach and go into the duodenum. And then off of the duodenum, we have the liver, the gallbladder, and the pancreas, which comes off of that via the common bile, bile duct. Okay? Um, the jejunum, the ileum, and then we go into large intestine, the cecum, and off of that comes the appendix, which we'll talk about. I know you did some of that in 132 with appendectomies, appendicitis. We'll review that again in this class. Ascending colon, the transverse, descending sigmoid colon, rectum, and then anus. So that kind of gives you that large intestine too. And the main purpose of the large intestine when we talk about digestion is um, digestion or, or absorption of what? That's right, fluids. Okay, so differences between adults and children in general. Again, we go back to that placenta. That is really the area of digestion where it takes place. Okay, so the GI, the GI tract is really considered immature at birth. Absorption and excretion begin immediately after birth, of, um, meaning that the infant starts to take in, obviously, themselves. Colostrum, which is the first milk, too, which is very small in volume, okay? Because really, the infant's stomach is extremely small, too. This is like the size of a pea, right? It's very, very small. So they really don't need a lot in terms of volume. What they need more of are the nutrients that's in the colostrum. And that's why sometimes when, when new parents say, oh, my child's taking an ounce or two of formula, it's probably way more than they really need for a newborn. It's actually stretching that stomach out because they really don't have the capacity to retain that much. And that's why there's a lot of spitting up. You know, spitting up, which is not pathologic, it's actually physiologic because that um, cardiac sphincter is still a little immature. And the spinning up really occurs because they're over full a lot of times. And also because of the immaturity of the cardiac sphincter. Um, secretions of enzymes are usually not at the adult level until about four to six months of age. So they pretty much catch up, but it takes about four to six months of age. Other differences. Again, I talked about this. The newborn stomach capacity is only about 10 to 20 mLs. So again, even an ounce of formula is already much more than they truly need. You know, but usually you see many parents who are like, oh, they take an ounce or two, you know, especially like two ounces, three ounces, and they're like a week old. You know, so again, probably much more than they need. Um, peristalsis, what is that? That's right, the movement through the intestines, it's, it's actually the muscular movements of the intestines that help to push along the food and fluids. Um, it's faster in newborns and in younger children. How do we know that? How do we see that it's actually faster? That's right. They have six to eight wet diapers a day, but also there's stool in there quite frequently, much more frequently, because they, again, because things go through the GI tract much uh, faster. And actually, the, at times, peristalsis is reversed in motion, and that's why you can also get the spinning up. So another reason for that. Immature muscle tone of cardiac sphincter, another reason for the spinning up, as I mentioned, and also some immaturity in the nervous system, especially the vagus nerve can cause some of that. So again, when we think about um, reasons why, especially preterm infants, have more of a likelihood of spitting up, it's because of all these things. The immature cardiac sphincter, the vagus nerve that's still developing, and they haven't had all that time in utero to have that. When cardiac 
skin for matures? Like at what age? Ideally, at birth, it should be mature if they had gone to 40 weeks gestation or, you know, 38, 39. So if they're preterm, is when that becomes more of an issue. Now, the issue to Ema is the neurological maturity. You know, obviously, the brain, for the first two years of life even, you know, the brain is still maturing, the nervous system is still maturing, and the vagus nerve directly innervates that sphincter. So while the sphincter itself might be very functioning, um, there are, every child has periods of spinning up, either from eating too much, you know, one feeding, maybe somebody else fed them and gave them a little too much, or because they still have periods where they're still developing. And then that should really end, they say really after the first year. Definitely six months you'll see a difference, but definitely after the first year. And definitely by two years of age, you really shouldn't have the spinning up anymore. You know, we all get a little bit of reflux. That's what spinning up is, actually. You know, we all get reflux, especially certain things do more with that reflux. They say young children who have more sugary things, more caffeine. So, for example, if children are drinking soda at young ages, they're going to get more spinning up, more reflux. You know, just like adults. You know the things, because you heard about gastric reflux in 132, right? So the things that trigger that too, but definitely by a year, two years of age, that should be diminished and you shouldn't really see it at all. If it continues to happen, now it's become pathologic, which we'll talk about. Okay, immature muscle tone and immature liver functioning still. How do we know the liver is still a little immature at birth? What did you learn with Mrs. Ormsby? That's right, jaundice, which actually occurs quite frequently, right? And there's the pathophysiologic and actually a physiologic jaundice that they kind of can get through after those first few days of life, right? So we're going to talk a little bit about those things too. I just wanted to review briefly about the nervous system and its effects, though, on digestion. You know, there's sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, right? Sympathetic is your fight or flight. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Actually, we talked about this last week even with cardiac, right? Your fight or flight. So when you're in fight or flight, where is your blood flow going to? What's happening? That's right, it's going to the muscles, it's going to your heart, it's going to your core, it's going to all your major organs, your brain, right? Because you're getting, you know, but it's not going to your intestines, it's not going to your stomach. So you actually have decreased digestion, or if anything, if there's anything that's there, sometimes it pushes it through quickly, you know, because you're going to have to run, or you're going to have to think, or you're going to have to, so that's not the area that it is. So it actually decreases peristalsis and secretions. You know? And then you have the parasympathetic nervous system. And this is what happens when you slow down, that's when you're, you know, it's like after lunch when you come back here, right? And you've just eaten, and now everything's going to, you know, kind of like, that's where all your, you know, your blood flow goes then. It's not really necessarily up here, it's more going to the GI tract. Again, when we talk about output, this is not something that you're going to have to figure out for any exam purposes, but just purely informational when we talk about output in terms of stool. Okay, how much you would anticipate seeing based on age. Actually, as they weigh more, it would be multiplied by less. But again, this is not something you would need to know for any example. It's just like an FYI kind of a thing. That's stool or that's No, output stool. It's GI tract we're talking about. Actual... How do you measure it in MLs? Not even. Actually, how do you measure a diaper in MLs? Yeah. Actually, grams kind of equals to MLs. So if we want to truly get an output, what you would do is you would take the diaper and then you take an empty one. I don't know if some of you had to do this in clinical, but like you would take the empty diaper and subtract it from a full diaper, and that will actually give you grams. But it, grams are like equivalent to MLs. I think they're off by like a point zero zero something. It's pretty similar. So the first actual disorder we're going to talk about is esophageal atresia which may or may not be seen with a tracheal esophageal fistula, or a TEF. So has anybody seen this? Heard about this? No, anything about Okay. So what causes it? What they have found about what causes it is that children who are exposed to certain tetragens early in the pregnancy can have this, okay, a lot of times. So this actually um, comes up for uh, many times a fetal alcohol syndrome, Down syndrome, again, uh, congenital abnormalities too can, can lead to this. So things like Down syndrome puts children more at risk for having GI problems like this. Um, there's other ones too, um, other, other mal uh, congenital, congenital um, diagnoses that tend to put them more at risk for this. And the biggest things too, again, are those tetragens, mothers who drink a lot, um, cocaine, mothers who are on cocaine, heroin. 
um, while they're pregnant have a higher likelihood of having children born with these disorders too. So what happens is in utero, and this can be seen many times in ultrasounds done later in pregnancy, but what happens, and many of you have actually, we talked about this, um, and many of you have seen this, is that people with prenatal care don't always have the best prenatal care. Somebody was talking last week about a woman that had had three visits in her prenatal period the whole time. So those are the kind of things that are gonna put you at risk for not knowing this ahead of time. But what happens a lot of times is this is diagnosed in utero with, with some of the later ultrasounds, like the 20 week plus ultrasounds. So um, again, esophageal atresia is when the esophagus ends in a pouch and does not connect to the stomach. So I have a picture of that over here, actually, if it gives you a better idea. And this also shows a tracheal esophageal fistula. So without even knowing what that is, by just looking at the name, tracheal esophageal fistula, what does that make you think? A passage, good, yet, between what? The trachea and the esophagus. That's absolutely right, a passage between the trachea and the esophagus, right? A fistula is an opening or a passage between the trachea and the esophagus. So if I have a passage or an opening between the trachea and the esophagus, what am I concerned about, really? Aspiration. Aspiration. Pneumonia. That's right, aspiration right into the lungs, pneumonia, respiratory distress, pretty immediate, right? That infant starts to take in large amounts, especially like formula and aspirin. Where's it all going? And if I have both together, which is usually what happens, well then it's going into a bland pouch which doesn't lead anywhere, so it's gonna fill back up and go into, spill into the lungs. And you can't breathe and you have fluid just pouring into your lungs, especially young newborn infants. If the stomach acid pours into the lungs, would that start eating away? Well, they actually can have damage, scar tissue, because what's gonna happen is the body's, it, it's gonna be caustic. You're right. It's going to be it's going to be caustic to the lungs, so they will build up scar tissue. They also they become fibrotic. So all of these kind of things are things we would want to avoid. So what happens? Well, before they used to actually give sterile water. You know, um, that they used to give like a little drink of sterile water to the newborns when they were first born to see how they tolerate things. Um, now again, you can have these together or you can have these separate. Okay, so you could have just esophageal atresia, or you could have just a TEF, or you could have both. So I don't want you to get it confused. So what would you see if you had just an esophageal atresia? That's why I try to, um, and again, these are some of the things that would lead you to have that. So a lot of vertebral abnormalities, things like spina bifida, which we'll talk about later in the neuro lecture. Things like anal rectal abnormalities and imperforate anus. Any tend to have problems with one part of a tract, like a GI tract, you might have problems with other parts too, because it means there was a problem during that period of development that caused problems other places. Cardiac anomalies, because the, cardi the heart develops the same time that many of these things develop. Um, renal abnormalities and limb defects. So clinical manifestations. Let's talk for a minute about which of these you would see which with, with which of these diagnoses. So choking, or difficulties breathing, respiratory distress with feeding. More common in which of those do you think? TEF or EA? TEF, right? Now the potential to aspirate when you have a blind pouch and you're spinning up is great too, but it's definitely greater with TEF. It's going to happen with TEF. These infants, both infants actually are NPO as soon as they're born and it's diagnosed. But one, you're going to see them turn blue immediately and start having respiratory distress. The other, you're going to see a nasal regurgitation and oral regurgitation. And you're not going to see that severe respiratory distress right away. Does that make sense? So when you think about clinically what you're going to see, if they have one versus the other, if you have one with a TEF, you're going to see the choking, you're going to see the coughing, you're going to see respiratory distress and cyanosis immediately. If you have an infant that has EA, you're going to see more sneezing, more excessive drooling, and a distended abdomen upper, epigastric distension because it's fluid that's gonna sit in that little pouch. So it has a little distension up there, you're gonna be choking, you're gonna be sneezing, it's gonna be coming out of their nose and their mouth. So if you're picturing that infant, that newborn, are you seeing the difference of what they look like? Unless you have them together, and then you're gonna see all of those things, but mostly the respiratory distress is what's gonna, and then that's gonna stop. So any of those things that the nurse observes, that's why there's always someone observing that first meeting.